welcome to another episode of ILTV. I'm your host, Lynn Ferrari. If you're interested in a European lifestyle, this episode is for you. Today, I'm joined by Jeff Updike. He's a travel writer for International Living. He's the editor of the Global Intelligence Letter. He spent 17 years covering personal finance and investing for the Wall Street Journal. He's a screenwriter, an author, the list goes on. Right now, Jeff is living in beautiful Prague in the Czech Republic, enjoying an authentic, laid-back European life. Life wasn't always so rosy for Jeff. A couple of years back, he found himself in the middle of a divorce after losing his job living in the US. And instead of just settling for a job to pay the bills, he decided to invest in himself and it paid off. On this video, Jeff talks about all the major benefits he's experienced living in Europe, how affordable it is, and for anyone interested in spending some extended time there, relocating there, or even just traveling around Europe better, Jeff has lots of useful tips. So please hit the subscribe button so you can join me for all future episodes. And I hope you enjoy this episode with Jeff. Jeff, good morning. How are you? Good. I'm okay. Welcome to ILTV. It's very good to have you here. And how is your morning so far? Cold. It's still cold in Prague, waiting for waiting for spring to, to bring some warmth here. I know, the end of the winter is always tough. I feel the same in Ireland. I'm like, come on, I need those evenings to get brighter because I feel like I'm tired at like 7.30 because it's so dark. I'm like... I love, I love the first snow of the year, the first couple of snows. And then by the time February, March rolls around, you're like, yeah, this is kind of good. I'm old. over let's, it. Let's end this. <laughs> Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Okay, we'll jump into it. So, Jeff, tell me a bit about your story. Um, what is your background and how did you end up living in Prague? So I worked for the Wall Street Journal for 17 years. Uh, I was in uh, Dallas, Seattle, and the mothership in New York. And uh, they ultimately let me work from home in South Louisiana uh, for, for a few years. Uh, and it, during that time, I, I had a, it was kind of a bizarre thing, but I mean, I had this interview um, years ago when I lived in New York, actually, I had an interview with a guy in St. Louis who worked for a bank and we got to talking and he asked me what I wanted to do in life. And I explained it to him, what I wanted to do, right? Travel the world and write about investing, all that kind of stuff. And he said, okay. And he said it in a way that was like, that's not a stupid dream, which a lot of people would say, well, that's just a stupid dream. <laughs> I mean, who's going to hire you to do that? Um, and when I was when I was living in Louisiana, I got a call from one of the Agora companies and, you know, it was an editor. And she said, hey, come to Florida. I want to talk to you. And it turns out the guy I'd met in St. Louis had talked to her and she ended up hiring me. Um, and I worked I worked there for a while, traveling the world, writing about investments and, and economics and things like that, which I loved. Um, but they had a you know change of management, and me and management didn't necessarily see eye to eye on on how to go forward. And so I lost my job at like fifty one, and it's like you know after having this golden life, I mean you know working for the Wall Street Journal, you know, and again I didn't even apply for the Wall Street Journal. They just called me out of the blue one day. Same with you know working for Agora, it just called me out of the blue. I, I haven't used a resume since. My first job out of college in 1989. That's crazy. Yeah, I know it is absolutely insane. Um, and uh, you know, when when I lost my job, it's like, well, what do, what do I want to do? And I'd always wanted to be a screenwriter. And I moved to California, went back to UCLA to be a screenwriter. And I've I've written a bunch of award winning screenplays. Well, not a bunch, three award winning screenplays. Um, and while I was there, International Living called out of the blue, <laughs> and it's like, hey, why don't you come to Paris? We want to talk to you about a job. It's like. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, so I fly to Paris and I get hired and, you know, they said, pick anywhere you want to live in Europe because I had to be on the European time zone. And it was like, okay. Uh, and I ended up in Prague. I, you know, I'd, I'd been to Europe. I grew up traveling north with my mom who worked in the airline industry. Uh, and so I traveled the world as a kid for free. Uh, and, you know, I'd been to a lot of Europe and I kind of knew where I possibly might want to live in Europe, and I just began doing all my research, and it turned out Prague was the best for everything I wanted at that time, uh, and so I ended up in Prague. You know, and it's it's been a fantastic experience as an American, losing your job, finding an even even better job, and getting to live the dream you've always wanted, which is to live and work in Europe. 
Very cool. Very cool. That's a very powerful story. I'm so sure a lot of people can relate to it as well. Just that feeling like there's no hope. And then out of that crisis comes so much opportunity. You've mentioned there. I mean, you know, that's, yeah, go for it. Uh, that's, I mean, you mentioned the thing, no hope. And I, I mean, it's. I, I guess that's a, a message I do want to share with people because at 51, when I lost my job, I really felt like there was no hope. Like, what am I going to do? Where am I going to find a job that paid me as well as I was, as I was getting paid, you know, working, working with the the Miami company. Um, And I was living in South Louisiana. It's not like those kinds of jobs are readily available in a place like South Louisiana. Um, and, and, you know, I had, I had family, you know, I was going through a divorce at that time as well. Yay me. You know, I was like, <laughs> everything, everything went wrong once. all at the same time. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I mean, it's not had family stuff. I had, you know, a lot of financial obligations that I lose this high paying job. And it's like, I really felt horrible for a while. And, and you, you sort of wake up on a random Tuesday and you're like, I can either live like this the rest of my life worried and just take some crummy job I know I'm going to hate after the first 17 days there, mm. or I can decide I'm going to invest in myself. And that's what I did. I used the money that I had saved over time and I went back to school and it was expensive as hell because I was living in you know South, Southern California, you know, going back to UCLA. That is not an inexpensive proposition, but I wanted to, I wanted to, become the person I always wanted to be. I mean, I wanted to be a screenwriter. I love that style of writing. Um, And so I invested in myself. And, you know, I truly believe that whatever universal forces exist out there, they kind of guide you where you need to go if you're just sort of open to accepting that, as challenging as it will be at times. Uh, And, you know, it it all worked out. You know, it's, and I, it it, it worked, if you, if you open yourself to the possibilities, it will work out. And that's sort of what I guess my message is to people in those kind of situations. Yeah. When you reach that crossroad, it's that gut feeling that like, am I going to settle or am I going to push myself and do something that I'm happy, you know? Um, Right. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's great. And you mentioned your mom and you traveled at a young age. Is that where you got your love of traveling? Yeah. Um, I was literally traveling alone. I've had this conversation with a lot of people. They can't believe this. I mean, I was traveling alone. This is back in the 70s before all the uselessness of airports these days where it's just, you know, airports are pain in the butt these days. I was traveling back before there were metal detectors and things like that. I was traveling back when they were still smoking on airplanes. (laughs) You know, people, people, there, there weren't the same kinds of fears and risks there are today in terms of kids traveling alone. So literally my mom, my mom lived in Houston and my grandparents lived in South Louisiana and I was largely growing up, growing up with my grandparents. Um, so my grandmother or my mom would take me to the airport and drop me off and I would wander off on my own at like eight years old. This is like the Houston airport. This isn't some Huge dinky little airport. airport. This is the, you know, intercontinental airport in Houston. Um, and I would walk in by myself to the Texas international ticket counter and they knew me. She was like, Oh, you're going back home again to go see your grandparents or your mom or whatever. Um, and you know, people just took care of kids that I guess, I don't know, because I would just wander in and go, go do that. So, um, so yeah, I was traveling a lot as a kid. Um, you know, and I, at at that, you know, by the time I was in high school, I, I don't know how many countries I'd been to, but I'd been to, you know, traveling through India, traveling across the Andes Mountains from Argentina to, to Chile. Uh, you know, I was, we were, my mom would call me up and say, hey, we're going to Guatemala this weekend, pack your bags. So, I'd, wow. you know, for four days I'd spend in Guatemala just goofing off at the hotel or whatever. Um, she had friends in Germany. We'd fly to, to Frankfurt on a whim. I mean, I learned German drinking songs when I was nine years old. Um, so, I mean, I just ended up traveling the world as a kid and airports, and, you know, airplanes and hotels, they're sort of like second homes to me now. I mean, I, I love going to airports early. I mean, most people hate airports. I don't think airports are as enjoyable today as they used to be because of sort of the challenges of getting to them. But, you know, I love airports and I get there very early. And I'm lucky because I travel so much. I'm executive platinum and things mm-hmm. like that with various airlines. 
So I go into the lounges, but I'll, I'll get to an airport four or five hours early just so I can go sit yeah. in a lounge and write and relax. Yeah. <laughs> so, I've, I mean, I've been to, what, 70 countries now or whatever the number is, every continent except Antarctica. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just grew up traveling the world and I love it. Yeah, and it's great you get to continue to do, the, to do that. And so all the places you could have picked and you chose Prague. So what, you mentioned a second ago that you kind of narrowed it down to Prague when you looked at what, your, what you were looking for, your wish list. So what, is, what were some of those things? Well, I knew I wanted to be in Europe, and I, I, well, I had to be in Europe for, for the job. Um, but I, Europe is where I've always wanted to live because I, as an American, I actually feel a little more European than I do American because I like the European lifestyle a little better. Um, it, it, for me, it seems a little more laid back. I don't know if Europeans would agree with me because I'm an outsider mm. sort of expressing my own, so my own view. Um, it feels more laid back to me. Some, but, some places in what? Europe. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, and I, I, I agree I, with yeah. that. I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. Um, but you know, when I was looking around, it's like, what do I want? Well, I want four seasons because, you know, I, I grew up in South Louisiana always hot you know we have 14 hours of winter on some random december day and then it's back to being hot um you know i, I lived in dallas texas hot as hell um and you know it's either it's either incredibly hot or it's an ice storm or it's tornado season those are the three seasons in dallas uh and i lived in southern california which is beautiful but you honestly and you're gonna think i'm crazy but you get tired of perfect days every day you know it's always sunny it's always warm in California. I mean, there might be a couple of rainy days in the year, but Southern California here, is I'm like, hmm. <laughs> you know, Southern California is as beautiful as it is. Um, it's the same every day, and I get tired of that. So I wanted four seasons. Um, I wanted to be centrally located in Europe um, because I wanted to be able to sort of travel around relatively easily on trains and whatnot. There was a tax situation involved um, because I wanted. After after going through a divorce and after spending down a lot of my savings through going back to, to university, um, I really wanted an opportunity to rebuild my my financial life, and I wanted to be in a situation where cost of living was much more affordable than say Los Angeles or even South Louisiana, which can be an expensive place actually. Uh, and I wanted a tax situation that was favorable to being able to save more, uh, and. When I looked around, I mean, the countries I were looking at, um, let me back up and say as well, I wanted a country where I could easily get a work visa um, because you have to have, you know, some sort of visa to, to stay here. You can't just use your passport and be on a tourist visa because you, you've only got 90 days in the Schengen zone and mm -hmm. you've got to be out for 90 days and then back in. That's just that's not workable, obviously. So I needed a, a, a visa that would allow me to work. Um, and this was before this whole digital nomad visa trend, you know, began taking off in 2021. Um, so, and this was 2018. Um, so when I started looking around, it's like, well, number one on my list was, was Scotland. I really would love to live in Scotland. It's an incredibly beautiful place. Probably one of the most beautiful countries I've ever been to. But Scotland's part of the UK and the UK has no easy way to get a visa yeah. for me to, to live and work there. So that you know, sort of knocked that off the list. Then it came down to, you know, tax situations as well. I could live and work in a place like Spain, but the tax situation was not favorable at all at what I expected my income level to be. I wanted to live in potentially Estonia, in, in Tallinn, Estonia, which I think is a beautiful little city, very Game of Thrones kind of yeah. place. Um, but, you know, the Estonian people, you know, they're, they, even though they have a visa that would allow me to go there, it's like, well, you could be a writer anywhere. You don't have to come to Estonia. So, no. It's like, well, thanks for that. <laughs> so they kicked me out. Uh, I was looking at Ukraine as well because I love Kiev. I'm glad I didn't end up there yeah. for obvious reasons. Um, and, and they said, yeah, you can come live and work here, but you've got to hire people. It's like, well, I'm not hiring anybody. So the way it all worked out is tax situation, visa situation, weather, mass transit, because I did not want to have to drive mm -hmm. after spending a couple of years driving L.A. traffic, don't want traffic anymore. All of that sort of thrown together, and it was Prague. I mean, Prague made a whole lot of sense because mass transit is everywhere. I can hop on trams and subways and get anywhere I want to go in a few minutes. Uh, my entire transportation budget for an entire year is $160. Um, you know, for, for most Americans, they're spending $500 to $700 
per month just on on their car uh, on their on a car note. Um, you know, and the tax situation is really low. Uh, you know, I'm taxed. I get to write off the first 60% of my income. So I'm only taxed on 40% of my income and the tax rate is 18%. I mean, that's, mm, that's that a pretty amazing that. tax. Yeah. yeah. That's a pretty amazing tax situation as a freelancer here. Um, and so everything just worked together to make Prague, you know, the obvious destination. I I think I mentioned this to you before, but I had um, visited Prague when I was like 16 or something. I was um, playing basketball and we went on a trip there. And I just remember it being absolutely stunning. The buildings just being like out of this world and there being beer in the vending machines. And I thought that was just so cool. So cool. Uh, but I'm definitely due a trip back to Prague, I think. Definitely. I mean, you mentioned a second ago just about the laid back European lifestyle and um, I'm from Dublin so like there is a laid back element to Dublin but you know in general it's a busy city but I definitely agree that with the wider Europe there is that fabulous laid back lifestyle they have a really good work-life balance and um, so it sounds like it's the same in Prague which is I mean what people yeah want. that's one of the things I mean I readily admit that I don't live a traditional European life because I earn a Western income in Central Europe, you know, in a country that used to be part of the old Soviet bloc. So my income goes a lot farther than a traditional Czech income. And I recognize that. But that said, when I travel around and I have traveled around a lot of Europe, there really is sort of at, at pretty much every income level, there really is a I work to live, I don't live to work mentality, which is entirely opposite of America. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you you feel a little more relaxed here. Like uh, this is a, a, I don't know, this might be a stupid example, but restaurants. I mean, I spend a lot of time in restaurants and pubs because I'm a freelance writer and I can go right anywhere I want to be. Um, and I've spent a lot of time in restaurants and pubs all over the place, be it Germany, Estonia, Croatia, Prague, you know, Spain, Portugal, wherever, in Ireland, when I visit Ireland. Um, and if I can go there and I can take a seat at like 1130 in the morning, let's say, and I can order a beer. And I could stay there until four or five o'clock in the afternoon, having written all day, and I might have ordered two beers, and I might have ordered a snack if I got hungry. Nobody said a word to me, ever. Didn't say a word. Just let me do what I want to do. If I tried to do that in an American restaurant or American pub, I would be kicked out because they want to turn the tables. They want you out. They want you to come, eat, pay, right. leave. And they want they want that to happen pretty much within an hour time span, maybe less. It's not like that here. It's just incredibly laid back. You can just go do what you want to do. People aren't going to bother you. And I really like that about Europe as a whole, just how comfortable it is wherever you go. Yeah, and so you mentioned there um, that one of the things you wanted was to not have to drive so much. Um, so I can see all the logical reasons to moving overseas, lower taxes, you mentioned lower cost of living, you know, there's better value real estate over there. But what are some of the other lifestyle benefits? Like you mentioned, you don't have to, to drive now. I mean, for some people, that's like incredible to think you don't have to sit in your car for like two hours a day on a commute. So what other lifestyle benefits have you have you experienced? Um, I feel healthier, honestly, because I walk everywhere. Uh, and it's not like I have to walk like miles and miles and miles or anything, because European cities, because they're so old and everything is kind of compact, so much different than America. Um, Everything is close. Like, you know, you might the supermarket, I have like two or three supermarkets nearby. They're small supermarkets. They're not like ginormous, you know, ocean liner size supermarkets that take up, you know, 400,000 square feet of space and, you know, in some American suburb. They're much smaller places and your selection might be is a lot narrower um, than what you're, you're typically used to. And I can't find Pop-Tarts very easily, which is a huge, huge problem for, for Europeans. You can't find Pop-Tarts easily. Oh my God, I think <laughs> so, I've ever had a Pop-Tart. <laughs> that, see, you would have elevated your life with a Pop-Tart. <laughs> oh, no, no, you have a pop anyway, list now, have a Pop-Tart. You, know, you, you can't find Pop-Tarts. I'm addicted to Pop-Tarts as a kid. Um, 
But, you know, to me, that's an easier lifestyle because I can just walk to wherever I want to go. You know, like I said, literally the tram is across the street from me. and I can get anywhere I want to go on the tram pretty quickly. Um, and the, the subway is, you know, a four or five minute walk from here or one, or one tram stop away. Um, so I find I find con- life is more convenient because I don't have to get in a car. I don't have to worry about where I'm going to park when I go somewhere. I don't have to worry about where I'm going to park in a city. That might not mean much to an American who lives in a suburb because they have a driveway. But if you live in a city, you know, you're, you're trying to find parking can be a hassle and it's expensive. You know, I don't have that expense. I don't have the expense of gasoline. I don't have the expense of car insurance and things like that. Um, the travel conveniences for somebody who loves to travel, who loves to experience different cultures, who loves to try different food, who loves to see different scenery. Um, being in Europe, everything is so close. I can get on a train and I can be in, I can be in Dresden, Germany in like two hours, wherever it is. I can be in Vienna in three and a half or four hours. I can be in Poland. You know, my, my wife and I rented a car and we drove to uh, Croatia this past summer to the Istrian Peninsula which is absolutely beautiful. It's sort of like Tuscany uh, at a, at, on, on sale. It's really cheap uh, there. You know, um, so everything is like really close. And I love that I can do that. You know, if, if I got in a car in, in South Louisiana and I drove for two hours, you know, to get to, you know, say, Dresden from here, um, I would either still be in Louisiana or I would be, you know, in Mississippi somewhere. If I got in, if I drove in Texas, if I started in Beaumont, Texas and went to El Paso, that's like 10 or 12 hours. I mean, I'm still in one state after an entire day of driving. I mean, wow. So and, I, and I, I'm not knocking America for that. I mean, it's just America's a big place. Mm. Um, you know, so I like the ability. I, I like that lifestyle that I can see so many different things and everything is so close. Um, it, it makes my life really enjoyable and it's really affordable because, you know, I don't have to I don't have a lot of the same kind of cost structure that I would have. If I was trying to travel, you know, from America to to Europe, let's say, or America to Asia or wherever, it's just an expensive. It's expensive to get in and out of America because of the distances involved. Yeah, and travel. Like, I, I mean, a lot of people would probably think that a European lifestyle is super expensive. You know, just you might have it in your head that some of the beautiful cities in Europe might cost, you know, crazy amount of money to live in. But even travel through these cities is pretty low cost when you're living here I know you know with some of the budget airlines even from Ireland you can get to Amsterdam for like 46 euro 46 dollars whatever it is and um, so that European lifestyle is pretty affordable um, I know you've mentioned a couple of things like how much your um, railway pass for the year is, is your metro card is like 160 um, euro so any other good value real estate examples or not real estate general uh, price examples for just how affordable that your well, lifestyle no. is um my wife and i will share a meal like we'll go to the pub next door and you know we'll get um uh, a schnitzel uh with a side of green beans with, that's cooked with bacon and garlic and whatnot and a beer and it comes with bread and all that fun stuff and the schnitzel is huge i mean the, the schnitzel is like somebody took half a pig and turned it into a schnitzel so it's not yeah. like <laughs> it's not like i can eat the whole thing myself so she and i will split something like that um and it's plenty enough for two people and that entire meal for two people will cost me about nine dollars i i can't get an appetizer in america for nine dollars you know if i go to i, I went to, the last time i was home i went to see my kids in south louisiana before i went and spoke at a conference in atlanta one of the io conferences and my son and i went to a restaurant and he had like a, 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 a shrimp po' boy, which is a type of sandwich in South Louisiana. And I, I might have had a burger or something like that. We both had fries and we both had iced tea. That was $62. I mean, it was absolutely crazy the amount of money that we had to spend at a restaurant. Yeah. $62 would, would last me and my wife here almost a month you know, on, on just normal meals for us, on a, on a normal going out to dinner, you know, two or three times a week if we yeah. wanted to. So the cost structure is just entirely different. Groceries are much cheaper here. If I buy imported stuff, it can be more expensive. Like there is an American slash British store nearby that occasionally will have Pop-Tarts uh, and I will go buy them there. Like a box of Pop-Tarts in America, I'm gonna guess is $253. 
if I buy it here, it's going to be like 450 maybe. So it's more expensive to buy, you know, imported things like that, that most checks are not going to be buying. But in terms of just normal food, normal life, um, you know, it's, it's things are just so much, so much more affordable here. Yeah. You mentioned as well, when we were talking before, just you had seen a property in Greece and it was absolutely stunning and it had like a pool um, and just how inexpensive that was, I guess. Um, that was on your one-year reach so travel. My, yeah. My, my wife and I are looking at actually moving from Prague for, for very similar reasons. Uh, and high on the list is most likely going to be Portugal. That's probably where we're going to end up. Uh, but we've, you know, we've traveled all over Europe looking in places that we think we might like just to sort of gauge them. Um, we were in Malaga, Spain, which is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, it's like somebody took the absolute best of Miami Beach, but wrapped it in Spanish culture and stuck it in on the Mediterranean. That's an interesting way to put it. And I've man, never heard of that way to describe it before. <laughs> I like that. Uh, and then, and then discounted the price by about forty percent uh, because it's a it's a really affordable place given how beautiful this place. I mean, it is a absolutely beautiful city. I'm, have you been to Malaga? I've never been to Malaga. No. Okay. Malaga is a beautiful city. I absolutely love Malaga. Um, but so we, we, you know, we've traveled in, to a variety of sort of Mediterranean countries because my wife grew up on the sea in Crimea and wants to get back to living by the sea. Um, so we've been traveling all around the Mediterranean looking at places. And we were in Greece and we, we, had, uh, we were looking in uh, on the island of Crete near um, Heraklion I've and near been to Hanya, Crete. Greece. It's beautiful. Yeah. Crete is like an island version of Italy or Tuscany mm -hmm. or something. It's just grape and olives, and, and it's just absolutely phenomenal place, mountains and stuff. Um, and and there was a there was a a house that was for sale. It was you know sort of this um, this this cot not a cottage it was a villa sort of a, a big concrete villa that was you know done up in a very Grecian way. It looked very pretty. Um, and it had like four bedrooms, beautiful kitchen, had this really amazing backyard with this this uh, swimming pool, really nice swimming pool. And at the end of the swimming pool, there was a like a gazebo that was on sort of a, a cliff ledge, and it looked out over over the sea. It was actually phenomenal. Like you, you're up high and you're looking out over the sea uh, and you have this villa behind you and this beautiful pool and the whole thing. I mean, you could rent the whole thing for like $1,800 a month, which is crazy. Yeah. You know, you couldn't find anything on any stretch of American beach except maybe Corpus Christi, Texas, you know, um, where you're going to live literally on the sea, on the water in a beautiful location for $1,800 in a four bedroom house, four bedroom villa, you know, with olive trees in the backyard, a giant swimming pool and a gazebo overlooking the sea. That just doesn't exist in America at that price range. But you can find that in Europe. You know, people, people do think Europe is a pricey place. And if you move to Dublin, if you move to London, Paris, you know, some of these places, yes, they are expensive. Madrid can be expensive. Barcelona can be expensive. But not everybody's going to move to a major big city like that. You know, when you move to some of these other places that are phenomenally beautiful, the, the value proposition is mind boggling because you just don't find anything to compare it to in the U.S. because you're so accustomed to what prices are in the U.S. for desirable residential properties. So I think Europe offers a huge amount of bargains for, you know, the, the price range that you're going to be paying for the quality that you're getting in the location. Like we're looking in, 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 uh, in Portugal right now, as we begin this process, and we're looking at the city of Cascais, which is sort of, you know, the Laguna beach of, of Portugal. That's, you know, sort of North of Lisbon, it's right on the sea, right on the ocean. Uh, and, you know, we found a beautiful three bedroom apartment, with a little office, uh, you know, and it's in a great neighborhood right next to a national park. And it's like a seven minute walk to the beach and it's a beautiful beach. Um, you know, and it was, it's like $2,000 a month, which is again, a really crazy low price relative to what you would expect something like that to cost in the U S. Yeah. And I always think of cash cash as like 
the Portuguese Riviera. You know, it has that yeah. feel. Um, and then it's only, what, like 30 minutes from Lisbon. So you've got a bit of wow. the best of both worlds. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Cascais. I'll have to come visit you when you move there. <laughs> and so where else in Portugal did you look? I know you went up the Algarve to check it out. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, she's only been to the Algarve and to Lisbon with me. Um, I, I've been in various other places of Portugal. I went up to Porto. I love Porto. Porto is a baby Lisbon with more hills. So if you if you want to lose weight in your butt and tone your <laughs> butt muscles, you want to move to Porto <laughs> <laughs> because the hills are crazy. Um, but it's a beautiful city uh, and, and really affordable, actually. There's some really nice apartments there, uh, both for buying and renting, that are quite affordable because it's not quite it's not quite yet to the same level of international interest as Lisbon is, but it's getting there. It's clear that there's a lot of regentrification happening in, in Porto. The, 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 the countryside, the rural areas are very much like somebody took Napa Valley and Sonoma Valley, California, and decided, hey, let's replicate this uh, in Portugal. Really beautiful wine country, hills and rivers and valleys, and it, just an, incre uh, an incredibly beautiful place. I would love to live something like that. I don't know that it is convenient to an airport for me because I like, you know, I travel mm -hmm. so much. Um, so I need to be closer to an airport. Um, and the Algarve is beautiful. I love the Algarve. Again, I'll, you know, I'll use a, an American reference here. It is literally like somebody had taken Southern California and put it in like Southern Orange County to be specific. Southern Orange County, San Clemente, San Juan Capistrano, and has put it in Portugal. I mean, there are parts like I used to live in, in southern in southern Orange County years ago when I worked for a newspaper down there. Um, I, there are parts of the Algarve where I have literally been driving and I've turned the corner like, holy Jesus, that's San Juan Capistrano. I mean, it looks just like it. It's incredible how close it is to to that. And it's the same sort of ambiance. It's it's Southern California, Southern Orange County, circa 1950s, meaning it's not. It's not underdeveloped, it's just underpopulated. Yeah. There's a lot of development that's there. There's a lot of hotels, really nice hotels and resorts. There's great restaurants and things like that. And there's you know fantastic roadways. It's just underpopulated. It's not like you get in your car and you're stuck in traffic for seven hours going four miles. It's just that you know you can go anywhere you want really quickly. Uh, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. I love the Algarve. Yeah, and so what are the what are the reasons drew you to Portugal? Um, so obviously the low cost of living, it's beautiful, all those things. Anything else that ticked your list? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because Portugal just released uh, a, a digital nomad visa on, I think, October 31st, mm -hmm. November 1st, somewhere around there. And in the first two and a half months, more than 200 people have already been approved for it, which is actually a large number of people for a digital nomad visa in that short amount of time. Um, their visa, I think, is probably one of the two best digital nomad visas in the world, the other being Thailand. Um, the, the Portuguese visa, if you, if, you're, if you just want to go for one year, fine, you can get a one-year Portuguese visa and you can live there for a year and you can travel Europe, um, which is another great thing about their visa is that it gives you free, it, not free, it gives you access to the Schengen zone without worrying about the 90-day kind of stuff that you otherwise would have to worry about. Uh, but after a year, you, you go away. The other version of the Portuguese visa is you get a digital nomad visa that comes with a five-year, what comes out of residency permit. So you can be there for two years as a resident. You can renew it then for three years. And after five years, you get to be, um, you can apply for citizenship. And when you apply for citizenship, you can immediately apply for a passport. So it is one of the quickest routes to an EU passport in all of the European Union. You've only got to live there five years, and suddenly you're a Portuguese resident, Portuguese citizen, and you can become, you can have a Portuguese passport. Now you have to learn Portuguese. You know, you've got to pass a Portuguese language test. I am fluent, 100% fluent in Spanish gibberish. <laughs> so that means I can probably get fine. by <laughs> with Portuguese gibberish enough to, to pass the test. That's actually very, I'd say that that's super interesting information just in terms of 
it being one of the quickest ways to get a European passport. Um, and we're obviously very excited about Portugal here at IL because it just got number one spot on the global um, retirement index. So um, I can see all of the reasons why you would choose Portugal. Um, and so you mentioned a minute, a few, a few minutes ago about Scotland, um, interestingly, and I know you took a trip there uh, at the end of last year. So tell me a bit about that trip. Um, yeah, I was there for um, one of the hardest assignments I've ever had in my life as a writer. Um, I had to tour whiskey for distilleries. Oh, awful. <laughs> I'm so sorry it that was happened. A horrible experience. It was a horrible, horrible experience. Um, no, it was fantastic. Uh, I was there for three or four days. I was hitting two distilleries per day. Um, to write a story for IL that ran maybe in the January issue, possibly. I can't remember now. Um, but it was basically the idea of, of whiskey as an investment. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of people who invest in fine wines and whiskey as, you know, investable assets because the prices for these things have a history of doing really well, actually. And so I wanted to write a story about whiskey as an investable asset. Um, and I went to some of the the top distilleries in the country and i mean tops not because they're the best known but because they produce high quality investment grade whiskeys and some of them are incredibly well known like glenfiddich and mm. and mccallan obviously the the big ones that people know but there are much smaller ones i went to like ben romach and glendronach and these you know these much smaller smaller distilleries uh, and it was a, a absolutely fabulous trip and i have to say Scotland is one of the single most beautiful countries in the known universe. It's, I mean, I love Ireland. I think Ireland's an incredibly beautiful place. I think Scotland is Ireland times 1.5. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you that. Scotland is absolutely stunning. I will give you that. Absolutely incredibly beautiful country. Um, and so I just, you know, I spent my, you know, I spent roughly a week there and it's just like, you fall in love with the place. And the first time I had haggis, you know, I, I went and decided I'm going to try haggis for the first time, which for an American is like, dude, you're crazy. Oh, for me, that's um, crazy. But, I'm like, no, thank you. But, you know, fair play to you. <laughs> it was, it was so good. Absolutely. It was absolutely fantastic stuff. God. So yeah. I loved my trip to Scotland. Yeah, you're, you're brave. And, um, I guess the good thing about Europe is that you can, you can, well, and you write for a living, so there's that, but um, you write and travel for a living, um, but you get to visit so many places that maybe the typical tourist would not visit, um, and that's another, I guess, great ben benefit about um, living in Europe, like you're not just flying into some of the big major capitals, you get to explore, I know you were in Badaban, um, Germany, uh, was that around Christmas time? Yeah, so my wife and I decided for Christmas we wanted to go to Paris. Um, and it's like, again, that's one of those things like, if you're an American, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to go to Paris for Christmas. I mean, you can, but it's an expensive proposition. You've got to fly, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, here, I can just drive to Paris. I mean, it's not like it's the, it's not that far. Um, and, you know, on the way we stopped in, uh, on the way to Paris, we stopped in Munchau, Germany, which is this beautiful little, ancient village on the German sort of French slash Belgian border, tiny little place south of Cologne. Um, you know, spent a night there wandering this beautiful little, this beautiful little German village from probably the, looks like 15, 1600s. On the way home from Paris, we went the Southern route and we ended up in Baden-Baden. Um, and I was like stunned by Baden-Baden because it's like it's it's this old German um, spa town from, you know, centuries. Excuse me, I think it was centuries ago. Uh, and it's it's surrounded by these beautiful hills and mountains. The city is just pristinely beautiful. I mean, it's it's this tiny little town, probably fifty thousand people, uh, and it looks incredibly pretty. You know, and we were you know, just walking around. There was a Christmas market there, a fantastic Christmas market. Like, you know, when you hear about Christmas markets in Europe, you hear the big ones. You hear Prague, you hear Vienna, you hear the one in Dresden, Germany. Uh, London has a fairly decent one. Um, and Baden-Baden had this cool little Christmas market that was all clearly local affairs. It wasn't sort of prepackaged European Christmas markets, which a lot of them are, sadly. This was clearly local Christmas fair. Okay. And it wrapped it wrapped around this central square. 
it was jam packed. I mean, for a city of 50,000 people, that felt like there was 150,000 people in this little Christmas market. It was so packed. Fantastic food. You know, people were bringing, you know, not just Christmassy kind of stuff, but there was like a Spanish couple that had brought, you know, um, uh, pickled artichokes and things like that. So they were selling a lot of really cool, unique artisanal kind of foods and items and whatnot. So it was a really great Christmas market to be a part of. It's one of the best Christmas markets I've been to. And I've been to a lot of them from London to, to Bucharest, uh, up to Tallinn, Estonia. Um, and as we're walking, we see these, these guys are probably in their 20s or 30s, and they're all dressed in tuxedos, but they're wearing tennis shoes, which was a weird combination. Hipster, um, and it turns out... <laughs> <laughs> it turns out they're going to the Baden-Baden Casino. There's a casino in town, and it's one that, like, Marlena Dietrich has called the most beautiful casino in the world. And I can see why. It looks like something out of, you know, out of Versailles in, in Paris. Um, a beautiful casino, but you have to dress up to get in there. It's like a James Bond casino. It's like you expect to walk in and see, you know, whoever the latest Bond was. I can't remember his name now. But you expect to see him play, you know, Bakker out there at the at the table um, because it's that kind of casino. It's it is the antithesis of what a Vegas casino looks like. I mean, it is just pure elegance. And to get in there, you have to dress the part. You can't just show up in a you know some goofy T-shirt or whatnot. You have to be in a, a suit and tie or tuxedo or something like that. So it was a it was a fantastic little experience. And the point being that you know when when you're an American and you come to Europe for a vacation you're going to typically end up in the big cities. You know, if you go to Germany, you're going to be in Berlin or Frankfurt you know, or Munich but for good reason. I mean, that's that's where all the activities and all that kind of stuff are. And you're probably not going to go driving to Baden-Baden or up to Munchau. You know, when you're in, in Paris, you know, you're going to go see Paris. You're not going to and you might go out to Versailles or something like that. But you're probably not going to rent a car and drive out to some little small town on the on the you know, the coast somewhere in Brittany or whatever. Um, you know, when you come to Prague, you're probably just going to go to Prague. You're not going to take the train and go to these, these cool little villages and whatnot. You're not, you're probably not going to go to Carlo Vivari, the spa, the spa town in the Czech Republic. So I've seen all these things just by driving around. I can't imagine there's a lot of Americans that are flying into the Istrian Peninsula in Croatia. You know, they're going to go to Venice, which is, you know, two or two hours away by car. Um, so to me, that's one of the lifestyle benefits of living in Europe is that I get to see parts of the continent that are really beautiful, interesting places to go and see and spend time that are not the major cities. I, I love that about this place. Yeah, you're giving me lots of inspiration. One of my uh, goals for this year is to visit more, um, I guess, small European towns and interesting places around Europe. I feel like I haven't as a European, I haven't explored it enough. I'm listening to you talk, and I'm like, I want to check that out. I, I found some when when I first moved to um, to Europe in 2018. I actually lived in Ireland for a while. I lived in, in Waterford for like a month, um, and I, uh, I I rented a car on the weekends and I drove Southern Ireland. You know, the the Gap of Dunlow mm -hmm. and the little town of Yall, and way out on the you know the far far southern southeastern coast. It's like the the last piece of European land before you reach America. Yep. Um, it is really beautiful, that part. I mean, people go to Ireland and they see, you know, they see Dublin. People go to Ireland and, you know, they might go to, um, you know, somewhere. What's the city out by Shannon, the Shannon Airport? What's that Limerick. big city out there? <laughs> Limerick. They go to Limerick. They might go down to Cork. Um most of them are not going to be driving around the, to y'all. I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of Americans that are going to come to Ireland, run a car, and go to y'all. But y'all is this beautiful little, beautiful little coastal town. You know that I would imagine most people aren't going to go to. Um, and it's just so you know when you're when you're in in um, uh, in Waterford and you take a train to like Kilkenny. Kilkenny is a pure, pretty little place. So I love seeing these tiny little towns all across Europe that. Most people just aren't going to even think to go visit when they're on vacation, but they provide so much more than just seeing the major cities in some particular country. Right. And, and a lot of these places are probably great places to relocate. You know, if you want that pure 
European lifestyle. Um, and so, okay, give me some more inspiration. Any more trips planned or coming up? Um, I don't know where I'm going soon. Um, I, I, I got to go back to Portugal because I got to do some stuff there. But, um, you know, one of the things that we're talking about doing, but we, we, we hope to be in, in Portugal um, by midsummer after uh, my stepson is out of school this year. Um, and to get there, we're talking about taking the long way to Portugal. And I mean the really long way to Portugal. And by that, I mean we're going to rent a car and we might drive from Prague through Poland up to Tallinn, Estonia, take the ferry across to Helsinki, Finland, drive from Finland to, to Sweden, Sweden across to Copenhagen and come back down that way. So we're taking the yeah, entire yeah, long way around. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so if we do that that should be a really fun uh, sort of fun adventure and you can work along the way isn't that great um okay so if you could go back and tell that guy that was living in the states had just lost his job was getting a divorce one thing what would it be i i don't know i don't know that i would change anything honestly because again like i said i think the universe guides you where you need to go and it opens the right doors for you at the time those doors need to be open. The, sometimes it requires you to turn around and look behind you because doors aren't always open directly in front of you. But I would go through the same process again because it has allowed me to be the kind of person I am now. It has changed me as a person. It has given me greater insight into what makes me happy it allowed me to pursue a dream and even though i'm not a a screenwriter or a tv writer right now i have i've had scripts that have been that have gone to netflix that have gone to hallmark you know christmas movie stuff um, and have gotten you know really big reviews you know one of them has the potential to become a, a movie you know i sold a screenplay um, to an independent, uh, uh, independent producer um, that that is in the process of you know they're trying to find the funding for it right now Very exciting. for a two million dollar two million dollar script. Um, so I the the process as painful as it was as financially challenging as it was was a learning experience and it made me the person I am and it got me to where I am right now in in Prague. I think the big message is simply that obstacles happen to all of us all the time in life, and you never know when that obstacle is going to crop up. Don't shy away from it, you know, hit it head on, be upset about it, be mad, you know, cry if you have to, but wake up the next day and say, you know what? I can either allow this moment to define me or I can define this moment. And I chose to define the moment. I like that. Um, and so what advice would you give to someone who was looking to maybe spend some extended time in Europe or maybe even relocate there? What is their first step they need to take? Um, I would, so if, you, if you've never, if, you, if you've been to Europe, let's say, and you know you wanna live here, um, Come back and visit the place you think you want to live, but do not stay in a hotel. Stay in an Airbnb or rent, a, rent something like that, but don't rent it in the heart of the tourist district. Go out into the other areas of a city. Like if you were, I'm just going to use Prague as an example. You could come to Prague and you can rent an Airbnb in the center of Prague and it's beautiful and you'll love it. But when you when you live here real time, you don't really want to live in the center of Prague because it is crowded 24 hours a day, pretty much the entire year, except parts of January and maybe a week or two in September. Otherwise, it really is a very busy place all year long because it's such a popular tourist destination. And it becomes loud and obnoxious and it's a challenge to get around. And, you know, it's just you don't want to live in the center of the city. Almost nobody lives in the center of the city. It's all Airbnbs for tourists to rent. 
So you want to see what life is like outside of the tourist area in the neighborhoods where you would likely live. You want to go shopping at the local supermarkets to see what that's like. You know, pay attention to what's available and what's not available. Yes. Check into healthcare. See what healthcare is going to be like. You know, are, um, are you going to be happy with that? If, if you're a person who, excuse me, if you're a person who wants to come to Europe or any other part of the world and pretty much live the life you live in America, then just stay in America because you're not going to find an American life in the rest of the world. You know, like I said, Pop-Tarts is a really stupid example, but it's a great example because things that you take for granted that you're accustomed to don't necessarily exist other places in the world. The, the expectations you have as an American, you need to check those expectations because the rest of the world does not operate on an American level. They don't think like Americans. Um, and they don't operate like Americans. And if you go into some place and you expect that, you're going to be sorely disappointed and you're going to be mad and you're going to be frustrated. And it's going to make your time in that country unenjoyable. So you have to come to any outside of America, you have to move with the expectation that my life is going to be very different. And I'm going to accept those challenges and I'm going to accept those differences and I'm going to roll with the punches that happen. And I'm going to be happy that I get to live in a different place and wake up every day to something new. I mean, I've been here for four years and I still find new things and I'm wandering around Prague and I love it. Some really, really power, powerful, uh, insightful advice there. So thank you for that. And um, OK, I want to finish off these interviews with a this or that question. OK, so. Just say the first one that comes to your head. They're very random. I just want to get an insight into who Jeff is. Okay, so test the waters or dive in the deep end? Dive in the deep end with a question. And guacamole or salsa? Well, that's a difficult <laughs> question. The, the first one was easy. This is impossible. I, mean, I was just thinking about making homemade salsa yesterday, but I love guacamole. I'm going to say guacamole with a side of salsa. You're cheating. <laughs> and art museum or history museum? Art museum. Art museum. I'd go for that too. Yeah. Um, Jeff, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Lots of really, really good advice there. Um, so if people want to find you or follow you online, any social accounts they can they can look up? You know, most of my social accounts are tied to cryptocurrency kind of stuff because I'm a crypto influencer on the side. <laughs> um, Man, of just, just, just... Man of many talents. Man of many talents. I would say follow me over at, uh, um, at, at Field Notes through globalinvesting.com. Global, global, globalintelligenceletter.com. Sorry. I will leave a Doing link below in the description. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeff is the editor of that newsletter. Um, so I will leave a, 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 a link in the description so you can go check him out and his writings out. And he also writes for International Living. So you can find his writing there. Um, Jeff, that was brilliant. Thank you so much for talking to me. And I will talk to you soon. And there you have it, another episode of ILTV. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Be sure to hit the subscribe button below, turn on your notifications so you don't miss out on any future videos, and join me for next week's episode.